Hi there guys, I'm Chris and today we have a 200 piece electronic jigsaw puzzle to solve. Hi there guys, I'm Chris Bowden and welcome to the Geek Group. Today we get to do something really awesome. Now when I was a kid I had a poster in my room when I was like seven that was like this big space console thing of a spaceship with a million knobs and buttons and switches and stuff and I, it was like foreshadowing for my life because my first real job before the geek group was I ran a recording studio. I, I built Mach 1 Productions and it pretty much started when I was about 12 with a four track system in my parents basement and no matter who you are in the geek world giant consoles are just awesome and today we get to do something that I've never seen in video before. We actually get to have a console that's completely disassembled and put it together. And we're going to talk about all the basic modules and how it goes together and the parts and what things do. And it's, it's really cool because a lot of people see these and have no idea what all the knobs do. It just looks like this giant terrifying thing. And they're not. It's really simple. And it all breaks down to basic fundamental modules. And today we get to take all the mystery out of that and we get to build one of these. This is a Wheatstone TV600 broadcast audio console, and it's going to be here in the Geek Group's Leonard Street Labs where we're doing the live stream and all that. This is going to be the audio board for that. It's a significant upgrade from our little 16-channel rack mount mixer. <laughs> and today we're going to put it together. Now, this process started when, a couple days ago, we got this console donated from a local TV station a few hundred miles away. And getting it on the truck wasn't bad. It was, it, we pulled it out of service. It, this thing was in production use of, as recently as like four days ago. Now, we got it on a truck assembled. Everything was fine. But when it came to getting it up the stairs into master control, it came completely off the rails. We had six people trying to carry this thing. And it was just too much weight. We couldn't get up the stairs. So halfway up the stairs, I took it apart. I pulled all the modules sitting on a landing with a lot of help. And then we carried it up here, and now it's in position, and I figured in putting it together, it'd be a really cool thing to make a video of, because it's a giant mixing console, and this is just cool. So with that, I'm going to start grabbing some modules, and we'll start putting it together. All right, so this is going to be kind of a weird video, because I've got to be up and down and up and down getting all the cards. But we'll t I just grabbed one at random off the top of the pile. This is number 18, and we numbered them you know, to match the, the tracks, you can see the, the frame itself is all numbered out all the way from one over there to 54 on this end, and we numbered them high and low, so it's pretty easy to tell that this is, you know, 18 high. So this one would go right here. Now, the, we'll get into the basic operation of it and, and how it works later in the video after it's all together. So to now, we're just, we're just going to start real simple and say what a mixing console is is basically the traffic cop that does all the routing for the audio in your studio. This is a broadcast console, so it's designed to handle pretty much everything live, and everything comes in on this side and goes out on this side. And it, com it can come in from pretty much any kind of source, from a, a simple wireless microphone like I'm wearing, to tape decks, cart machines, mini discs, CDs, DVDs, studio cameras, all kinds of stuff. This is one of the input cards and it's an MI64 card and on the bottom they use card edge connectors, there's three of them and these connect down into the frame where there's all kinds of sockets in rows for parts of it it's three sockets down here and they look, it's, it looks just like 8-bit ISA slots actually so there's three of them over here there's four out in this section and then back to three and then four over in the end and then down on the lower parts, th these are where the, the faders go there's a single slot for all those down here. And they're all connected together with ribbon cable. So this just slides right in. And it's 18. I'm going to take my sticker off. And we'll line it up right here. We just plug it in like that. And I'll make sure everything lines up just like it's supposed to. And then make sure you're lined up on the back. And lined up with the metal. And then seat it firmly in place. And there's our first upper channel. Now I'm going to put all the screws in later. We've got a whole box full of screws and an electric screwdriver because you'll kill yourself doing this without it. So that's our first module. Now what we've got on here is we've got gain and then sends one through four, channel pan, some matrixing, an EQ here, 
and then a pre-fader listen cue, a channel peak light, and a solo. The manual for this console, to, to give you guys an idea, is this book. And, and this, is, this is how technical documentation should be done. I mean, you never see this with consumer grade gear, but when you get into serious pro gear, it's the manual's two inches thick, and when you open it up, there's full detailed schematics. Every single part, every connection, every wire is all laid out. It's, it's amazing. This, this is how documentation should be done. So let's grab the next one. All right, so I've got a couple smaller ones. This is eight, and this is actually the, the fader part for the bottom of the channel, and I'll give you guys a good look there. That's, this is the fader housing. Now this is a really big deal. The, the brand and quality of fader is everything in a mixing console, and these are as good as it gets. This is a Penny and Giles fader, and they're beautiful. We're actually gonna get a look at one of these. They give you a couple extras, because when you buy a console this big, they know that you're gonna have to do repairs on it, and they give you the parts to do that. So this is number eight low. So I gotta go way over here, line everything up. Drop that right in position. Now you'll notice some weird stickers and stuff on this console. As part of our overhaul and refurbishing of it, we're taking all the original owner's stickers off because it's all things like, you know, this is the weather channel and this is Bob's mic and things like that. And our use will be different. Like this one here, number seven low, says WX desk on it, which is probably the weather desk. And there you go. You can See that? The weather desk. All right, so now this is going to be pretty boring, so let's just start rocking out through them. 38 and 39. All right, now if you look inside these, the parts density is pretty serious. You got to understand this is 1990s vintage. And there you can see inside that all the stuff that goes into making one and all the trace work on the back. This is all custom stuff. They make this in North Carolina. They, they make all this stuff themselves, 38 high. And building a mixing console is not a trivial thing. The frame itself is simple. It's furniture and some very basic electronics. But when you get out into the cards and the modules, it's just as much art as it is engineering. Now, the back of the cards, you'll notice, have D sub connectors. This isn't like a, a little mixing console, like, you know, where you get into your Yamahas and your Mackies and stuff like that, where they have XLR and TRS and stuff like, you know, the, the basic, cons you know, the, the semi pro, prosumer grade stuff. This is all hardwired, and you need an engineer to be able to interface the console with the rest of your studio because you take all the D sub connections out and you make your own cables. Look here on channel 25, here's the top of the card, but the module on the bottom doesn't actually connect to anything directly on the bus. It just hangs in there. 25 and 26 are both like that. Now here's another neat one. This is module 27, and it is a CR64 card, which is kind of cool. You can see in a lot of the cards I'm noticing this, they have the, Wheat, the Wheatstone logo embedded right in the copper of the board. And you can see this on top has a whole bunch of switches. And these are for picking different sources. And then you can see all the switches here. And they've got a million electrical connections at the bottom that go into this really big matrix right down to the bus. I'm trying to show you guys this stuff. It's kind of hard. The camera's a little weird from what I'm used to. But check that out. You can see all the feeds that come up into the switch matrix. And then there's a lot of electronics down here for the mode, solo, cue, level, 
all that jazz. Now this is card number 27. It goes in right here. Line everything right up. You don't want to force it. It's just, just snug, just a light fingertip pressure because there's all kinds of things you got to get to line up to get one in. You should never have to use more than just you know, thumb pressure to get it in there. This is not a process to be rushed. Just take your time and work through them one at a time. Here's 53 low. Now we have 54, which I think is just an extra because it doesn't actually plug into anything. It just sits down here. It fills the hole. Here's 28 high. Uh, 28 high is uh, another big source selector. Pops right in there. Here's 13 and 14 low. Now the little cards are every bit as complicated as the upper ones. You can see right here, this is 14 low, and it's, it's a basic fader unit. You've got your mix minus assign buttons up here. The on switch, which I'm guessing is just a kind of like a take button. And it has a single card edge connector down there. Boom, pops right in. So there you have it, we're assembled. Now this is as the console came to us. We've pulled most of the stickers off, but there's still a bunch left. What we have done is cleaned out inside because this thing, in just sitting like this in a still room for a long time, it's probably been in use for 10, 20 years by now. I think it's about a 1990 vintage. Um, it, it accumulated a lot of schmutz. You can see all the dust and stuff around certain knobs and that, the, the ones that get a lot of use. You can definitely tell where people lay their hands all the time. And now that we've got the inside all cleaned out and we've got it back together, we're going to super clean the outside, take all the stickers off, which is going to take us forever, and get a couple of our more OCD crew members to sit and super clean the console, which will be a fun time, I'm sure. But when it's done, we're going to have this really beautifully restored Wheatstone TV 600 console, and this will be our main audio for the live stream. So it's going to be really cool. Now that we've got it together, you can really see how things group. And at first glance, it's this really intimidating thing. But when you get into it and you really take a look at it, you can realize that it's not that terrifying. Because yes, there's all these giant knobs, but it really breaks down to the same thing over and over and over again. So you don't have to worry about all this. You just have to think about one strip. And it's really simple. Everything comes in this side, goes out this side. Everything comes in at the top and goes out at the bottom. So it's, it's like reading a book. It's left to right, top down. And if you look at it, up at the top, you've got your gain, which is your input volume. And then you've got things like 48 volt, which sends out a phantom power feed. You've got pad, which is uh, uh, like an intentuator, just mellows it out a bit. There's some other stuff. Uh, this one, I'm guessing, is a phase. And then there's an insert thing. These here, you've got the, there's, they're double stack knobs. This is a double stack knob, but the, the big one on the bottom is a line level, and the little one's a mic level for two different types of inputs, if you have a microphone or like a CD player or something. Down here, you've got the same thing, except it's the center one is pan and it's got a center detent to keep it in the middle. Pan is basically balanced, left or right. And then the bigger knob is the level, and these are S1, S2, S3, S4, so I'm guessing they're sends. 
which can send it off to an auxiliary bus or monitoring or whatever. Then you've got your main channel pan. This is your assign for things like stereo one or stereo two. So if you press like stereo one here, it'll send it off to the stereo one output over here. And then you've got a bunch of other sends and pan and monitor. And you can press that and hear it. Down here, you've got a basic parametric EQ. So this sets the value. Th this is the frequency that you want to equalize around, the center frequency. And this is how much. So if you think of it like uh, a basic parametric EQ, where you've got your audio waveform and you want to bring it up at 1 kilohertz, you can bring this over to 1K. And then that's up or down. And it's a, a nice four band parametric EQ. Actually, it's a three EQs, and then the bottom one is a low pass filter or a high pass filter. So it's, it's really simple. This is just all your audio, everything you could want to do, everywhere you could want to send it from one thing. And then you go down here, and this is your volume. It's, it's your fader. So you can set all your stuff and then set that to where you want the level to be. And once you get all this set up, you don't have to mess with this anymore, and it's all just riding faders. And they're nice, beautiful, long, smooth faders. Over in the middle here, we've got a lot of mastering stuff. You see they're all labeled master, master, master. So this here is a, a, a control section. This is where all the big stuff goes. So these are all your inputs. Here's your controls. And then this over here. Now these look to be simpler inputs. These don't look to be outputs over here. I think the outputs are here, and there's some outputs here. And these are another set of inputs, because you've got things like cart, CD, beeper, VT10, 11, 12, and then 13 is way over here, which is kind of messed up. But yeah, it's, it's going to take us a while to figure out what everything is. And I think at this point, I might even be able to power it up. So let's, let's give it a shot. We've got the power supplies mounted in a rack, and I've got the cables in. So let's see if we can get this thing to light up and get to do something. All right, so we've got it all assembled. And just for fun, because I'm a dork, I pushed every button, and I made every possible light come on, I think. Nope, I can get a couple more. There we go. Oh, see? I figure it's got a pair of 600 watt power supplies. I might as well get my money's worth out of them. And, <laughs> and with some consoles, um, the modern computer control surfaces, which aren't actual consoles, it's basically just a really expensive mouse. Um, they've got like a Vegas mode for getting into DigiDesign stuff, where, you know, for using Pro Tools and that, where they've got a Vegas mode, and you can just make it do like designs and stuff. This is old school. This is straight up analog. You have to actually push all the buttons. So we did, and nothing blew up because it's quality. It's awesome. And there you have it, all the lights on. So now we'll kill the lights in the room, and here you go. It's a geek Christmas tree. How awesome is that? It's beautiful. Look at all the lights. <laughs> all right, turn it back on. There you go. So I want to thank you guys for watching us just bathe in geekdom. This is the ultimate big giant console with a million knobs and buttons and lights and switches and just, yeah! I want to thank the guys at Wheatstone for making such an amazing piece of engineering art. And now that we've got it all together, now we can take it apart. And let's take a look inside at a couple of the pieces. I'm going to shut it down. Now let's pull a couple of cards and really get a look inside. While I pull these out, I'm going to, there we go. I was wondering when you're going to get the lights back on. See, that's going to be nice. Hey, while I pull these out, I'll give our guys a couple minutes to put everything, you know, turn the lights back on. But here we go. Let's just grab a couple at random. Gerber Ninja time. Because I have to get under it and pop it up. It's really high quality manufacture because they all perfectly fit together. Pop that out. They make a tool for this, and in the manual it says, hey, look for your, your card removal tool. And I looked for our card removal tool, and it's not there. So apparently that was lost along the way. Now, this is an MX card. It's just labeled MX, and this is the fader bit. And we can get a good close look right down in there. You can see the parts density on them is pretty serious. And here's all the buttons on top. So we'll put this back in its spot. Hang on, I just noticed something. The inside of these, 
is threaded just a little bit. And it's a bigger threading than the console. See, they didn't put a picture of the removal tool when they mentioned it in the manual. I think what I thought was the removal tool holder may be the actual removal tool. I may have got this figured out. I could be wrong, but I'm going to give it a shot. I'm going to do an experiment here. I think this, see, I saw this sticking out the bottom, and I thought that was like the holder where like there'd be like a lever thing. But I think this screws right in. It does, and it lets you pull it right out. So we'll grab one of the channel strips here. It'd be cool if I had two of these. We'll pop that right out. It's a nice solid thud when they pop out. Now we can look inside. This is neat because you can see there's handwritten notes on it right there for ID numbers. This one says, oh, it's quality control. It's QC3FB, QC35, QC2, first B. 146. It's neat that this is, it's handmade. Somebody really put a lot of work into making this. You can get a really good look inside there. See all the componentry. There's so much that goes into this giant console. We'll put that back in. Thud. Grab my tool. Now we've looked at the SC64's cards. These are SI64 cards. I'll be really careful not to cross thread this. I'll grab it from this end. This is very similar. This is an SISW64A. I'll give you a good look at it there. Look at all the engineering that goes into that. I mean, this isn't little SMT stuff. These are, these are real components. There's your solder side. And then here's the controls on the top. And all that goes out, those two D subconnectors. And it all plugs in down to a common backplane that is the main console chassis. So there you have it. That's a, a serious look in it. And now my next task is to put all the screws in it, which is going to take a while. But it certainly beats doing it in a staircase. There was a spot for a second one of these. If you look down here, there's, there's one with the console, and there was a second one. And somebody stole it long before it came to us. So I'm just going to screw that in there, and if we ever need it, we've got it. So there's your look at, on, inside a Wheatstone TV 600 console. There will be a lot more coverage of this console as we do all the soldering and, and the rigging to get it all together because We've got to get all the connections to it sorted out. We've got to get this actually wired into the building, and that's a process, but that's going to be a Steve job. So I'm Chris with the Geek Group. Thank you for watching. Please remember to rate, comment, subscribe, and donate. It's your support that makes these videos possible, and it's your donations that keep the lights on here and that are going to let us be able to get this thing working and on the air so that you, as a Geek Group member, can come in and sit right where I'm sitting and push all the buttons. So you guys have fun. I'll see you next time. This video was made possible by a grant from the Future Girl Foundation. This video was made possible by thousands of private donations from members and viewers like you. Please visit thegeekgroup.org for more information on how you can donate and become a part of our dreams of Avalon.